Scores, coins, missiles, retro games are filled with all sorts of numbers. And while they seem simple, there's a lot more going on here than you might think. So in this video, I'm gonna break down some examples from a couple of iconic games and show you why it can get weird when you're keeping score on the NES. Numbers are everywhere in video games, like the score in Super Mario Bros. In the game, the score is displayed as a decimal, which makes a lot of sense because it's the number system that roughly everyone on Earth currently uses. But it's not the number system used by computers. That honor goes to binary, with all of its zeros and ones. Binary and decimal are both completely valid ways to express numbers. It's just that binary numbers get kind of long and hard to read, and decimal numbers don't work out so well when you represent all of your data using logical circuits built out of transistors. And modern programmers don't don't usually deal with any of this. Use decimal to define your variables, handle all your math in decimal, and display the value in decimal using some sort of print function. Behind the scenes, the data is all stored in binary, but you only ever have to deal with base 10. And this is not at all how Super Mario Bros. handles the score. Instead, the game stores the number as a mix of binary and decimal all at the same time, which is weird, unless you're a computer programmer from 1983. Back then, you'd probably know all about this method. It's called binary coded decimal. Let's take a look at an example. This is a number, and in decimal, it has four digits. In normal binary, the number is written like this. But in binary coded decimal, we don't want to use this number. We want to use this one, which probably looks just about as confusing as normal binary. But when you split the number into chunks, it gets a little easier to see what's going on. The first four bits represent the number one, the next four represent a three, the four after that, another three, and the final four bits are the binary number for seven. Each of the decimal digits are right there, just encoded one at a time as tiny binary binary numbers. So binary coded decimal is just a clever way to store decimal numbers on a computer while still using binary. Now, the version I show here uses 4 bits, but the score in Mario Bros. uses 8 bits instead. This makes sense because the NES accesses memory 8 bits at a time. It's an 8-bit system. But on the NES, storing numbers like this comes at a cost. The processor inside the Nintendo is based on a very popular chip from the 1970s called the 6502. And that chip has a way to do math directly with BCD numbers using something called decimal mode. Without looking at the code, you might think, okay, the game stores the score in binary coded decimal, then switches to decimal mode to add points when you stomp on a Goomba or something. That's the way they'd probably do it, except for one problem. The processor in the NES doesn't have decimal mode. So I don't know exactly how it went down, but when Nintendo was designing the system, they needed a way to produce sound. And instead of adding a separate sound chip to the board, they decided to rip out the decimal mode from the 6502 and replace it with audio processing circuitry. The Nintendo Nintendo already had two processors, the CPU to handle the game's program, and another chip called the PPU to handle the graphics. My guess is that they decided to do things this way because adding a third processor would be kind of annoying. Basically, you can't just plop another chip onto the board. You also have to add additional circuitry to enable communication between the chip and the CPU. This makes the board harder to design, adds more components, and ups the cost of each unit. So if you can have your audio processing built directly into the CPU, it makes things a lot easier and a lot cheaper. History lesson aside, this all raises a pretty simple question. If they didn't have decimal mode, then how does Mario handle BCD? Well, in this case, they have to write their own subroutines to handle addition and subtraction. And it's very likely that you know these algorithms, because you probably learned them back in elementary school. Basically, they just do the math by hand, whatever that means for a computer. In addition to the score, the game's timer is also stored in BCD. So given that both of those numbers were stored using BCD, it stands to reason that the coins would be handled in the same way. But they're not. The coins are stored in regular binary, which is kind of the way you'd think everything would be stored, but Mario's weird for a lot of different reasons. Anyway, while the coins are stored in binary, they still have to be displayed in decimal. And the way you do this is to convert the pure binary into, you guessed it, BCD. The code for a routine like this is a little confusing, but let me give you the gist. The most widely known algorithm is called Double Dabble. I'm not even kidding. And the idea is to convert the number from binary to decimal by repeatedly shifting it to the left and sometimes adding three. Basically, you set up the memory with the binary number to the right and enough bits to hold the decimal digits on the left. Then you begin shifting. Every time you do a shift, you check each digit to see if it's five or above. And if it is, you add three. This works because shifting a number in binary is the same thing as multiplying it by two. So every time we shift, each of the digits is being multiplied by two. And if you multiply a five by two, you get 10, which technically fits in a four bit number, but we don't want that. We wanna carry the one instead. 
With a digit of five or above, if you add three, the next shift will push that one into the correct place. And by doing this process over and over again, the final digits appear as expected. Why they went this route for the coins, but not the other two numbers, I don't know. It was probably just too slow to convert the other numbers using this method, so they just kept them in BCD. But what if you don't want to display your game's numbers using digits, and you want something a little more... Visual. This gets to another big thing in video games. There's a lot of different ways to communicate numbers. You can use pie charts, health bars, or in the case of Zelda, hearts. When you're showing numbers using pictures, stuff like binary coded decimal is pretty useless. And on old school systems like the Nintendo, you have to be a bit clever with how you do it. In the game, both the number of hearts and how many are filled is stored in a single byte of memory. The data is split into two halves, with the value for the first half holding the total number of heart containers, and the second half storing how many of them are filled. Well, technically, the first half is the total number of hearts minus one, and the second half is a bit more complicated because the game uses partial hearts. Remember, you can either have a full heart, a half heart, or an empty heart, and the game stores how full a heart is using a whole nother byte in memory. When the byte has a value of 255 down to 128, it displays the heart as full. With a value of 127 down to one, it shows the heart as half full. And with a value of zero, it of course shows an empty heart, which is kind of sad when you think about it. On the surface, this is kind of weird because the game uses a lot of values for just three states. So what's going on here? Damage. Damage is going on here. You know how after you get the armor ring, you can be hit by some enemies multiple times before you lose even half a heart? Yeah, this happens when an enemy only does a small amount of damage per attack. Each attack chips away at that big partial heart number, so you gotta be hit multiple times before you lose half a heart. And honestly, depending on how you look at it, this could be a good or a bad thing, because the game is technically hiding information from you. You don't actually have a full heart for each of those hits, you have something between a full and a half heart, but showing you all this information visually on the screen would be kind of absurd. For instance, this is what Zelda would look like if you had full heart containers and wanted to use a single pixel to represent each point of health. Not exactly practical. So even though the range of health values is really big, they keep the display simple. This also makes it easier on the player. Instead of having to keep track of a large number, they can take a quick glance at their hearts to see what's going on. That's like two bats with one boomerang. But all this math and UI design aside, I think there's a much simpler reason that they chose hearts. They're just way more fun. Imagine you just finished off a boss and it drops a 256 instead of a heart container that you can then add to your big health number. That's kind of mid. And other games do something similar to keep things interesting, like the pips in Ninja Gaiden, or the health bars in Mega Man. Or you could go the Contra route and have everything be a binary is alive or is dead flag based on if any moving thing on the screen hits you. If you've watched to this point, then I have a confession to make. I tricked you. You thought you were going to watch a video about weird retro game stuff, but instead I gave you a lesson in mathematics, programming, and computer science. So if you want to take that learning to the next level, might I suggest this video sponsor? Brilliant. With Brilliant, you learn by doing. They have thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, AI, and programming. These lessons help you develop real critical thinking skills and teach you how to understand and work through problems instead of memorizing solutions. One of my favorite things about Brilliant is that it helps you develop a daily learning routine. Math and programming are really big topics and you can't learn them all at once. But with Brilliant, you can develop solid habits that help you learn at a steady pace and really get a deep understanding of the subjects. Their programming courses are particularly awesome, with lessons that help you learn essential coding elements and how to really think like a programmer, which is kind of important if you're going to make retro games. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash nesshacker. You can also scan the QR code on the screen or click the link down in the description. If you do, you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 